Well, I came to tell you the story of the fight for freedom for this country, for our people. After 2,000 years since the fall of Judah, we didn't have the taste of freedom, of independence for 2,000 years. Then some Jews decided it's time to change. We live in this country, we have all the rights to live as a free nation and to liberate the country from foreigners and if the foreigners are British we have to fight them to kick them out otherwise they won't get out and to fight them means to give everything that a person can give to sacrifice life to sacrifice personal freedom not to be killed to be in jail for many years or to be hung by the British and they decided to be ready for all that just to bring freedom to our country and when I heard that there is a fight for freedom I looked to join them it wasn't easy they acted in underground secretly it took me a long time till I could trace them and join Lehi Lachamei Herut Israel Fighters for Freedom of Israel at the beginning I was part of a cell we got different orders to collect to collect uh, information about the British about their movements about ways to ease our boys attacks and what I would say excited us pasting our posters our underground proclamations on the walls it has a tremendous importance because at that time all the Jewish establishment, Zionist establishment were against us and the press were against us they uh, they are full of articles and declarations that we are fanatics that we are, we call, we are going to cause trouble and who are we to fight the British and we explain that as I said, it's about time to liberate this nation and there is no other way. So we had to suffer from mass incitement against us and to face the British Empire to fight. And people walking in the streets, facing our posters, they read what we had to say and it has some influence. That's why it was so important. And the British understood that they they have to deal with a new kind of Jews, Jews that can't bow, that don't bow, neither to pressure nor to, uh, to other ways. And they did efforts to stop our activity. They ambushed one we were trapped in one of their ambushes. They jumped from an armored car and they shot at us from the revolvers, from the, the machine guns, which was set on the uh, armored car. Miraculously, we felt they pointed to our heads, but miraculously we survived. And still, we knew that there are others in danger of the life much more than we do. Those who attack the British. It was so dangerous even to carry an arm, a gun or a uh, pistol or a or whatever, hand grenade, means to risk life, to be endangered, that, uh, to be sentenced to death if they catch you. And we begged our superiors, our commander, to let us take part in this fighting, but because of our age, they wouldn't let us. I was, we were a cell of six, five boys and a girl, and I was the oldest, I was 16, the others were 15, even less. Time passed. I'm sorry because my short of time I had to to shorten my uh, to, not to tell everything I would have loved to tell you. Anyway, I already became almost 20, 18 when I got the good news that I'll be part of the fighting force. You have no idea how how excited I was since I joined the underground. Every day. I had, whenever I went out, I saw 
those British soldiers, policemen, walking in my streets, imposing a foreign rule, and, uh, and because of them, Jews couldn't come from Europe. They blocked their ways. When the Nazis and those who helped them in Europe massacred, annihilated six million Jews, and they are to be blamed that many of them, maybe hundreds of thousands and maybe millions, could have saved their lives if they would open the gates of our land to people who, who try to escape Europe. But they blocked their ways to life with no mercy. And now I'll be one of those who will carry arms and shoot at them. I felt I'm like one of the Maccabees who fought for the sake of our land. The excitement was tremendous. And we fought them. We attacked them in all kinds of ways. We blew their traffic. We blew their trains, we uh, bombed their uh, police headquarters and attacked them in different kind of ways. Whatever they tried to do, it didn't help them. They brought over here almost 100,000 troops, 15,000 policemen, just to be able to deal with us. And it didn't help them. Because of a short of time, I won't tell you many of the things that anyway, Whatever they tried, they, sentencing boys to death, hanging prisoners, and our reaction was very strong. They had to pay for it, and they, they surrounded themselves. Every place there were, their camps, their offices were surrounded with an enormous amount of barbed wires, of sandbags. It didn't help them. All the time we found tricks and blew them, blew them in the most fortified places. And they saw that it doesn't help. One day, wh what can they do? They knew that they we were very few. The Lehi power in Jerusalem, I mean the uh, fighting force in Jerusalem of Lehi, were four cells. In every cell, three or four or five fighters. And facing, I mean Jerusalem, facing almost 50,000 British policemen or uh, soldiers. The Irgun also had a stronger, I mean they, were, uh, they had more than we had fighters, but I'm talking about us. Unfortunately, more than 80% of our boys and girls could not fight because they were either imprisoned or detained in detention camps, and most of them Almost all of them were arrested because Jews informed the British about them. And that's what's really hurting. But anyway, despite all that, they see that they know that we're few. They didn't know how few. But anyway, they knew that we're few and they're, they cover the country with their troops. So what? in what we are uh, better? So they came to decision that uh, because we are in the underground, we act secretly, we don't have any uniforms, we don't have anything to, to identify us. So how will they find a way to trace us? They decided to try something that they did try in the past and they paid for that high price and they stopped for a long time. Now they decided because they, were, they didn't know what they can do. One day I hear that my best friend was arrested. He was to bring to few boys a pack of, of the Hamas, our war paper, and he didn't arrive. We understood that he was arrested, but they uh, denied that they arrested him, and at the time we understood why they denied. It appeared that they tortured him to death, and they, uh, for that we won't see the signs of the torture, till now we don't know where he's buried. But, uh, Little by little, we we've heard things about uh, what happened. There were a few uh, boys in the street, children in the street playing, and they saw how this British caught him, and there was a struggle. At the end, the British managed to push him into a car where there were more British, and the car disappeared. One more thing they saw, the hat of this British fell from his head. We come to Lagba Omer, you know what? 
people doing Rag Omer, a yeshiva bocher, was watching a fire, and he saw on the on the wood and the other uh, things which are on the fire, as well a hat, which kind of hat that the British uh, detectives used to wear. He took the hat right before it was set afire, and this hat fell into our hands, and we saw there was the name of this British uh, guy, Faran. And we found that this Faran was an officer who commanded one of the toughest commando, British commando soldiers, the SAS. They brought them specially to this country to commit such things. But when they found, because here the detectives wouldn't do it, they knew that their names are known to us and they feared, so they brought this group. But once they found that we know his name, they knew his life in this country is in danger. They smuggled him out of this country. He came back to his England because his name became known. His friends received him with parties and they sent him gifts. And one day his brother, gets to, his younger brother, gets into his house and he saw a package, a gift, a, a, a Shakespeare plays in this, uh, in this package. From curiosity, he opened the, the package and this package blew into his face and he got badly wounded. And there was a drama that even Shakespeare would think that will happen from his uh, play that he was badly wounded and he died after one week of torture. This way, this Farhan, who tortured my best friend to death, has to see with his own eyes how uh, because of what he did, his younger brother is dying out of torture. And we uh, do our best to remember Whatever we know of what our heroes said, especially before they died, like we know Samson saying, let myself die along with the Philistines. Those who were hung by the British sang Hatikva, so that our nation will know why they're giving their life. To become a free nation in our country, the country of Zion, Yerushalayim, Zion and Yerushalayim. We don't know what my good friend said when he was tortured, but we do know something much more important from all what he could say, it's what he did not say. They tortured him and tortured him. Tell us, tell us names of your friends, where you hide arms, where you meet, and not just asking him to say, torturing him badly, and he won't tell them one word from what they wanted to hear from him until he gave his life when he was from torture when he was 16 and a half years old. Remember the name, Alexander Robovich. The British thought that they found soft stone which uh, defends our secrets. He was a young boy, he was thin, maybe physically he was weak, but spiritually he was so strong that he managed to break the torture is instruments of the British Empire. And for that he gave his life. But then they wouldn't dare, because they paid a high price for that. We traced some of his group and killed them in this country, so they will know we won't give up this. They won't dare do it. And they said, all that doesn't help. 100,000 troops sentencing prisoners to murder, to, to murder them by, on the gallows, and all that, it doesn't help them. They asked the United Nations to send a, an inquiring committee to find out, maybe they will give them a suggestion how to deal with what they call violence in Palestine. I read a book which I recommend, I don't know, maybe some of you read it, Trinity, about Ireland. Ireland. For 700 years, the Irish tried to liberate themselves from the British hands and they rebelled again and again and during all this period they did not manage to harm the British as much as we could, as we did during two or three years. And the United Nations Committee came and then something else happened which stunned the British from another 
there was one prison that they were sure from there no one will be able to escape. From all other prisons there were stunning escapes. Even in Africa they detained hundreds of Flehi and Etzel boys in detention camps in Kenya and Sudan and Eritrea and also from there there were some escapes. But the Akko fortress with such wide walls in the center of in the, in the heart of an Arab uh, town and then but the boys begged, the prisoners begged their friends the outside, do something to get us out of here. We want to fight. And then the Etzel carried a daring attack. Maybe it was the most daring, I would say, uh, war action in history. The Etzel boys went through the British camps, through the Arab streets of Akko, and climbed over barbed wires and sandbags and blew the wall and tens of Etzel Velehi boys and Velehi boys managed to escape. The whole world was stunned. Papers wrote all over the world the most daring prisoner escape in history. But it uh, costed a, uh, a painful price. Three of the Etzel boys who went to, to, to act were killed. Six Etzel and Lehi prisoners were killed and three Etzel boys were arrested and sentenced to death. And the British hung them and they sang a tikva one after the other and after everyone sings it gets hung to death in the middle and all prisoners continue until they complete what the boy meant to say Liyot Am Hofshi Ba'atzenu Eretz Yon Yerushalayim and they couldn't continue because they were hung so the whole prisoners continued and and sung and the Etzel to stop murdering Jewish prisoners by death sentences they kidnapped two British soldiers and they warned the British not only you can hang you are not the only ones who can hang. If you will dare hanging our boys, you will hang those who are hostages in our hands. The, Etzel, the British hung the three boys and the Etzel hung the two soldiers. If until then there were in, in the all Britain were in, so upset from what we do to them, from the heavy casualties from the, uh, the uh, econo economical tremendous price they paid to stay here. After that, there was a big cry all over England, in the streets, in the papers, in the parliament. We can't continue more. Such a thing did not happen that people who are ruled by us will dare hanging British. They are so shocked that the British government sat and decided enough. We can't continue more ruling in this country. They told the United Nations about their decision to evacuate. Of course you can't evacuate 100,000 troops in one day. They decided they need the time till May 15, 1948. The United Nations Committee got the, uh, they were asked to try and suggest a uh, solution. If the British leave, they invited the uh, Jewish leaders, the Arab leaders to hear what they have to say. We, Lehi and the Etzel, we know what we wanted. This is our country. We prayed for it for so long. We fought for it so badly. It should become a Jewish, liber a free Jewish state. But our political leaders. They didn't believe that the British will ever leave. That's why they caused us a lot of trouble. But they were Zionists. And they tell them, they're leaving. What do you suggest? Because a Zionist is natural that they will suggest a Jewish state. But the Arabs won't accept. So what can we do? They said, you know what? Let us divide this country between us and the Arabs, as if the Arabs need any more states as if this country is as big as Canada maybe or China that we can divide it 
with no question. Then they asked the Arabs, what do you suggest? But the Arabs leaders boycotted the United Nations Committee. They said, who are you to tell us what to do, to decide for us? What will they say? What they had in mind, they wrote in their papers, they screamed from their minarets that they are going to complete where Hitler stopped. It was just in 1947, two years after the annihilation of six million Jews in Europe, the Arabs declared they were going to continue with 600,000 Jews in this country. And they had reason, I mean, they had means to think about that. They got help by the British in arms. They had all the Arab countries back them. But the Jews did not, the people did not believe. Why won't they be, we believe? After the Arabs murdered so many Jews in the early, in the, in the 20s and the 30s, after the Holocaust was so fresh, why won't we believe what the hatred to Israel can, to the people of Israel can do? Tell you why they didn't believe. I see what people say. Well, we know them now better. They know us better. It's not those primitive, the primitives which were before. Now they work for us and they have to, they have to feed so many children. So they depend on us. So it's not, we can't believe that they will leave all that and they will risk all that and they will say what they uh, threat. They do what they threat. That's why they didn't believe and that's why when came the United Nations decision in 1940, in uh, November 29, 47, about the division of this country, Masses, masses of Jews got out of their homes and danced in the streets from joy. We're going to have a Jewish state for the first time after 2,000 years. And they danced all that night. Actually, I and my friends were sad. We were the first ones who said we will fight the British and it will end up by establishing a Jewish state. We were sad. And those who did not believe they are they are happy and dancing. What kind of states we're going to have from the United Nations decision? Can you imagine a Jewish state without Judea, Samaria, Sinai, which belong to us, and the Golan Heights, which belong to us? And not only that, the Western Galil won't be part of our state. It will be in the Arab sense. And Jaffa, Ramle, Lod, Beersheba, all this will not be part of our state. How will our country will look. And not only that, Jerusalem, neither all, all Jerusalem, which were lasting for, for so many generations, or the New Jerusalem, which were, most of it was inhabited by Jews, will not be part of the Jewish state. For that did we pray and lasted and, and gave everything we could in any way, in poetry, in prophecy, most of it, the most beautiful prophecy was about the day that Jerusalem will be, will be liberated and will be uh, part of our kingdom, I mean the center of our kingdom. And to give up Jerusalem and to dance, we, all the years we didn't stop facing Jerusalem in our prayers, we refused to face any other place. And we did not want to be happy without swearing for Jerusalem. In every wedding, in every breath, we repeat this swearing. If I will forget the Jerusalem, my right will be forgotten. And here you forget Jerusalem, you forget your right and you dance. This Jerusalem that so many heroes gave their lives for it. The Maccabees and other, the, the, uh, those who rebelled against the Romans gave, they covered this country with their blood. And it won't be part of our state. But right the next morning, we found that all the United Nations decision was in vain. They decided, what did they give us? Nothing. Right after that, we found out that if we want something from in this country, what we won't fight for, we won't have. What we won't take with our own hands, we will not have. And right next morning, 
the people had to twist from joy to Christ for being killed. We found ourselves killed all over the country. The traffic which tried to move on the roads were atta was attacked by the Arab villagers and the passengers murdered and and the, the, uh, what they did to their bodies it's sickening and the worst was Jerusalem Jerusalem a town which was uh, inhabited by Jewish neighborhoods neighbored by Arab neighborhoods through their windows from the wall from their roofs they pointed their guns and shot and killed and wounded and killed and wounded men women children who went out to play or to or to study were either killed or within a short time we found ourselves in terrible situation and the british are here they have about half a year to stay until their last evacuation and they get informed of the situation and they decide the british decide that we have no chance to survive more than a few weeks. What did they did with this information? They stopped the Arabs with more and more arms. Go ahead, kill Jews. Shorten the, uh, the time for, for what you have in mind. And they also formed an Arab modern army, the Arab Legion. At that time, that this army will be capable. Most of the officers were British. Also, the general officer commanding of this army was British, Glob, and they had arms which he didn't have. Arms of a modern army, cannons, mortars, mortar cars, and they used these arms. They shot and bombarded and killed along with the Arab gangs. And uh, what can we do? From the Haganah, they told people, their boys, to stay in different points and to shoot back whenever the Arabs shoot to us. But uh, they told them, we don't want any trouble with the British. If they come to search, it would be better to give them your arms than to confront them. The British heard that Jews defend themselves in certain place. They surrounded the place with their troops and they disarmed the boys and this way our neighborhood had to face with no mercy the Arabs uh, snipers from the other side and once the British committed a terrible thing after searching the uh, in the uh, Mandelbaum uh, place they disarmed the four Agana boys which they found them there and they kidnapped them forcefully they forced them into a truck and they took them and handed them to the Arab mobs near this, the uh, Damascus gate and the Arabs lynched them they murdered them they cut their bodies into pieces and what was left from the bodies they they uh, carried and danced, they sat and danced in the, in the streets of the old city. And we, the Lehi, were the smallest group, but the most active group in, in Jerusalem. We thought we have, we have to react. We need more arms. We have so many enemies. I was asked to patrol the street with a, with a group of boys, with few more boys and we were told if you will face any British patrol and it will be possible to disarm them by warning them with the revolvers we had to do it if they will resist to shoot each of us got a revolver and I got a special uh, thing to, to do in this action to defend my friends in the withdrawal. So I got also two bombs, a hand grenade and what we called petarda. It was a small bomb which was smaller than a finger with no any uh, metal uh, pieces. But when it 
it blows, it doesn't harm much, but it, it makes tremendous noise. Why that? If I see that the British are after us, us, I should throw the grenades over them. But before then I had to look around carefully to see if there are not passers-by Jews in the area. In such a case, I won't throw the grenades so that the Jew won't be harmed. So I will throw the small bomb and suppose that if the British hear the blow, they, they bow and they uh, just not to get harmed and it can help us run away. I don't know why my left hand is faster than my right one. So that's why I used to draw the revolver with my left hand and I put the uh, grenade in my left pocket and the small bomb in the right pocket. But this time, I felt something troubling me in my pockets. I didn't know what it is. It bothered me and I didn't know as if someone tells me, listen, you didn't put the bombs in the right place. So what can happen? I changed the places. I put the, the grenade into my right pocket and the small bomb in the left pocket. Let, this be, let it be this way, so what? And then we faced two British policemen carrying Tommy guns. The Tommy guns were the best guns at the time. I told my friends, Yofi, let's get to them. But they felt something and they started pointing their arms to us. One of us pulled his revolver and shouted, hand up! And then we heard shots. I tried to get my, my revolver and something stopped, a shake stopped my hand and I couldn't understand the reason that I couldn't move my left hand. And what I see, one of the British ran, uh, ran into a street and uh, two of my friends were after him. The other one, friend of mine, tried to get from him the gun and they struggled, each one pulling it. And I, I fear that the British will manage to kill my friend. I can save the, situa the situation if I manage to, to get the, my, my pistol and shoot at the British, but my hand refused to move and I didn't understand what causes this, uh, this thing which paralyzed my hand. And I didn't know that my friend was already hurt with a bullet in his lung, but he, he <laughs> held the, the, gun, the, the gun so hard that the British gave up and left him with the gun and started running away. And he came to the cor close to the corner and I thought this is my last chance to shoot, shoot at him. Otherwise he will turn right, I won't see him anymore and he will call for, for help and we'll be in trouble. Right this very second I managed to pull the pistol and shot and he fell dead. He was killed, I saw him dead. I started running, I felt I don't run properly, I was limping. I didn't understand what happened to me, before then I couldn't pull my pistol, now I'm limping. Maybe I'm wounded, I asked myself. And then I felt pain in my left pocket. And then I found that a bullet passed through my thigh, from one side to the other, and got from the, out from the other side. And it passed also my pocket. And then I thought, what a miracle if the grenade would have stayed in my left pocket, it would have been blown and killed not only me, also my friends. Then I understand that was a big miracle. Well, at the time I understood that the wound wasn't serious because uh, it didn't reach the, uh, the bone. And so after about two or three weeks of limping at treatment, I managed to come back to activity. But the situation around was very, it was worsening. Jerusalem was not only bleeding badly, also it was getting strangled with, with in, a, in, a, in a siege. Trucks who tried to bring food to Jerusalem were blocked by the Arabs. Our establishment trying desperately to save Jerusalem from hunger. They uh, loaded big convoys of trucks with goods and uh, they said there are many boys to defend the convoys to bring food to Jerusalem but what can we do if the Arabs control the hills on the way to Jerusalem when this 
convoy arrive, arrives to a place like Sharagai, Babelwad, where the Arabs are on the hill, they block the way of the traffic and set up fire. The convoys, much of the supply was set up fire, some of it was looted, but the worst thing that so many boys were burned to death in those convoys. And this time, the British, uh, the Arabs managed to get two cannons and they set them in Nabi Samuel and they bombarded Jerusalem. And they caused us so much trouble that anyone who tried to get out of his, his house, he knew he can risk his life. But what can we do? People had to stand online to bring a piece of bread to their children at home, to bring some water home. Many of them did not come back home. They were hit, if not by the bullets, by the, by the bombshells. It was such a terrible situation. The ch many children uh, stormed over the fields to eat grass to survive. Many of them were shot and killed by the Arab fire. At that time we thought, if we want to stay alive, we can't wait to see we the Lehi thought. Our tactics were different than the Haganah. We thought if we want to survive, we have to bring the angel of death into their own houses. And we did what we could. Lifta strangled Jerusalem. It was a village in the end, close to Jerusalem that if a truck managed to survive the, the uh, Arabs fire in Babel Wad and the, to come to Jerusalem, to, to come to Jerusalem with, with uh, supply, they were shot by the Arabs from Lifta. I was asked to go to this Lifta with a group of boys, everyone had a, a cargo of 20 kilo dynamite in the, during the night, in the dark of the night, we got into this village and we blew the most threatening house, some of the most threatening houses. Since then, there's no more Arabs in Lifta. They were, they all ran away. We had trouble with uh, Sheikh Badr. Sheikh Badr was an Arab neighborhood who controlled some Jewish neighborhood. They were in a hill and uh, they, they could uh, control the uh, neighborhoods of Zichron Yosef and uh, Nahlat Achim, where most of the people there were all, people who came from Kurdistan and uh, Iraq and such places and they were very poor they uh, they, uh, they had and they, were, uh, they had every family had a lot of children and their children are uh, are most of the time in the street even at that time the parents could not keep the children, all of the children at home all the time. Children got out just to to get some air were hit by the Arabs from from Sheikh Badr. There was one big house in Sheikh Badr which controlled the whole area and from there they shot and killed so many children that it's terrible. One night my friends climbed over this hill which was called Sheikh Bader, they blew this big house. The house was blown and turned into ruins. And after then, in the Nakhlaot, in Nakhlatachim, Zichron Yosef, they hear a fantastic voice of silence coming from Sheikh Bader. No more shooting. Who found what happening? The children. They climbed up and came back. Abba, Ima, there's no more Arabs in Sheikh Badr. They all fled after that. You should see how 
the reaction, the reaction of the population there, of the Jews who, who lived there, how they, they could now live in peace. But we knew that we had to make much more than that. Around the, 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 situa the situation is worsening. Many Arab volunteers come from different Arab, Arab countries and join the Arab gangs here. And uh, the Exxon bloc was going to fall. Also the local Arabs, the villagers there, they tried to get into the Exxon bloc kibbutzim and they shot and they raided and and then they came the, Brit the British, I mean the Arab British, the Arab Legion, which bombshelled them with their cannons, with their mortars. And there were Jews who thought we have to do something to save the Etzion Blo. Thirty-five boys, I call them the Lamed Hay, went to help them and they didn't arrive. All of them were killed on their way. And the Arabs, after, after they kill every, everyone who falls to their hands, they not satisfied just by killing. They cut their bodies, their heads, they, the, the different organs, and they take pictures to show how, how great they, are, they were by, by the Satan's hands. At that time, yes, and the, the castle, which was actually the gate to Jerusalem, was falling from hand to hand. Haganah and Palmach boys tried badly to keep the castle in our hands because they knew if the castle falls, falls, Jerusalem is open to the enemy. And it was very difficult. So many were killed to keep the uh, castle in our hands. At that time, the American government got information from their intelligence services that the Jews are to be annihilated. They, are no, they have no chance to survive. What does the, the uh, American government do about it? In America, many, many Jews, mainly youth, who took part in the war, in World War II, not long ago, in the American army fighting the, the, the Germans in Europe with fighting experience, and among them generals and officers with with the know-how of warfare. They wanted to come to help us as volunteers. They collected an enormous amount of arms which we needed badly to bring with them. At that time, the Americans imposed an embargo. Every American citizen who will dare coming to help us as a volunteer or smuggle arms to help us will be sentenced to 10 years of imprisonment and losing his American citizenship. And that's why they didn't come. Few came, but there are very few, like Colonel Stone called himself Marcus here and unfortunately was killed here. But the masses who could save us stayed in America because of this embargo. And we, the Rechi, contacted the Etzel and told them, listen, we did what we could by ourselves and you as well. And in this situation, we have to do something strong. How about joining forces for carrying a very a, a, a stronger attack, which may help us in this situation? The Etzel agreed, and here came the decision to conquer the village of Bir Yassin in Jerusalem area. Because of different reasons, we lost the surprise element. And once we approached the village, they surprised us and shot. And I see around me, one after the other saying, I got wounded. And then we understood. If you want there, Yassin, we have to storm over the village and to get straight into the fire facing us. And that's what we did. And we organized this small group of boys and ran into the village where they shot at us through their windows, their roofs, behind their uh, walls and from every direction you can imagine we found them shooting at us and we trying to 
save our lives by shooting back, back and killing as much as we can to be able to carry our mission. I get into a narrow street and I face an Arab preparing his, uh, his rifle to shoot. I thought he will shoot first, can survive. I pulled the trigger and there was something wrong in, the, in my uh, gun and it stopped uh, of shooting. And I thought if a minute before then, a second before then, I would think that this will happen, I would have uh, uh, see myself as dead. But then I saw that the street was not straight, it was uh, tw uh, like a curve, it, it was curved in a, in a way. So I turned back and tried to get the wall defending me from my left side. Part of my body was behind the wall when he shot and here I felt something in my right thigh and saw a hole in my, uh, in my pants. I understood. Uh, it wasn't serious and I told a friend of mine, my friend killed this Arab so I could get his rifle and continue, to continue on. It took us a whole day. We started before daylight and we ended up after midnight until we managed to conquer this Diria scene by bitter, very bitter fighting. Five of our, our boys were killed, 42 wounded, but we caught them a lot of casualties and when the Arabs found that many Arabs were killed in Dir Yassin, it doesn't go with what, with what they had in mind. They are sure that it won't take long till they will put an end to our existence here to complete what Hitler's, where Hitler stopped as they said. How will they explain this? So the leader said that the Jews in Dir Yassin who attacked Dir Yassin were such savage that they massacred women and children with no mercy and such lies. True, we had to fight back and to shoot back. But we will not carry atrocities like they said, but because they, they are such people, they are sure that, it, sure that it's true. And this panicked the Arabs all over the country. Now, the Lehi and the Etzel boys, those who fought the British and kicked them out, now they come against us and they start running away from all over the country from fear. Whatever, any noise they heard made them leave everything and run away. This way the Haganah could conquer the Galil almost with no fight. This way the Arabs ran away from Haifa, Safed, Tiberias after the first fight. The action in Dir Yassin took place in April 9th, 1948. Now we could breathe properly, our enemies were defeated, our Arab enemies, local Arab enemies were defeated, and in a month from now, the British end their, May 15 will end their, their rule. And then we hear that the British already evacuated the Russian compound. The Russian compound was not just another place, the Russian compound was the most fortified place in the country by the British. There was the British police quarters which was blown by, by the underground twice. The central prison. If every place in this country they were surrounded with great amount of barbed wire, sandbags, the Russian compound was surrounded by a sea of barbed wires, by hills of uh, sandbags. You can see in my book two pictures which show part of the Russian compound, how it looked at that time. The people call this area Bevingrad, after Bevin, which everyone hated in this country, was the foreign minister of Britain. And they left Bevingrad. When we heard that, we thought, now the way to our generation's dream is almost open. Bevingrad, the Russian compound, separated between Jerusalem, which was in our hands, and the old city. So we contacted the other organization, come along together, 
let us liberate our Yerushalayim. Unfortunately, they refuse to come with us. Those are the reasons, those are the excuses, but we found ourselves alone. We know alone we won't be able to do. We don't have enough arms and, and fighters for such a, uh, an, a, a big action. But we thought, we can't give up. Jerusalem is waiting for us for 2,000 years. So we'll do whatever we, we can. We'll conquer what we can and then we'll see. We got into the Russian compounds and it was fantastic to see without British. They left the place which symbolized the British Empire more than any other thing. They left to their England and we're there. Anyway, Jerusalem is waiting for us. We got into the most extreme building facing the old city. We got into it and we saw how it was fortified also in, in the inside, the windows, the doors were blocked with concrete, with the barbed wire, with the sandbags, and we pointed our guns to the other side. We saw the Arabs trying to fortify themselves. We shot. We were told, stop shooting. Why? We were told that early in the morning we have in mind to storm over the building separating between us and the old city to try to conquer those buildings. And uh, we suppose that we, we won't have enough uh, uh, ammunition. That's why it's better to, to save our ammunition for this action. So we stopped shooting with the dark, also the Arabs from the other side stopped shooting at night. We've heard the bell, the uh, Churchill's bells rang and violated the silence. I told my, at such a time, I told the friend who was beside me, you know, you are what I think, to whom the bells ring, was the time. They looked, at, he looked at his watch and said, 12, midnight. I said, this is the time of the Jewish nation. At this very moment, the British finished the rule in this country of ours. From this moment, our nation will start walking the first steps of freedom. I was so excited from this fantastic minute, I thought I had to do something, I have to do something to remember this great moment of the Jewish history. What shall I do? I took a grenade and threw it to the side of the, of the wall. The grenade blew and the Arabs thought that we start an, a night attack and they shot to our building enormous amount of bullets but we were just two in this fortified building which we said it to each other let them let them we knew that all their bullets were was either stuck in the sandbags or got uh, stopped by the by the wall it took a long time till they stopped shooting Early in the morning, I was called with another fighter and we were told that we will be the first ones to storm, to attack, to liberate the buildings near the, the, uh, old, uh, near the wall. Each of us had a group of boys. Gershon had to take his boys to conquer the uh, Fast Hotel, where now we have the Dan Panorama Hotel. So, we knew that now we're going to, to, to face a tremendous fire. Once we got to this a, a square, which is now, it's called the Kikar Tzal, Tzal Square. We, they shot at us from all kinds of directions and we arrived to the building and we found the gate locked. And when we had to face uh, long, long seconds, Facing the Arab uh, uh, fire toward us, we had to wait long second till a small uh, amount of explosive we hung on the lock and it blew it and the gate got open and we got into the building. I already told the boys, don't let them surprise us. Every room you approach to, cover it with fire. This way we conquer the building, this way 
We killed a few Arabs there, and uh, I asked my friends, I hope that you all right. There's no casual. We have no casualties. We have no. No one was uh, wounded. Seems that everyone was all right until I saw one of the boy's face. He had an eye bleeding. I told him, Michael, you're hurt in your eye, and you, and and you're not telling anything. I'll uh, call to carry you with it, with a uh, stature. He said, Leave me now. I'm all right. I can point the gun with the other eye. Let me continue on, and he got into to the window to watch. And then I used my throat, I would say, that was the only instrument of contact we had at that time, and shouted to the other side, the, all the post office building is in our hands. And I got told that more, more buildings were already conquered by our boys. It wasn't easy, we had casualties. And then one shout at me, El Nakam! Tell your boys there. We, ha- we got informed that by people who heard on the radio. Yesterday Ben Gurion declared the establishment of the Jewish state. The state of Israel was established. I hear this and from my window I see the old city wall and behind this wall the place of the kingdom of David. And the temple mount is within reach. Let us get there also if already we have a Jewish state. But we couldn't continue on. We had already four of us killed. Most of us badly wounded. We were left less than ten boys and girls. Won't continue on. But we ran out of ammunition and we couldn't continue. We had to stop. We stopped, but we didn't, but we didn't give up. With the time, we got more arms, more ammunition. More boys joined us. Some of the wounded were uh, uh, recovered and came back to the ranks and then we were ready again to fight after two months we got the word that we were going to get to liberate the old city it was in a Friday morning and we were told that there is an agreement with the Haganah and the Etzel all the organizations together each from a different side we will storm over all city to liberate it. You have no idea how excited we were. We are going to liberate Yerushalayim. I thought about the Maccabees, which liberated Jerusalem and got glorified for eternity. And now we are going to do it. The afternoon, after we got the instructions and the arms, we stood in ranks. It was, I would say, a stage. It's not just a stage, it was a ma'amad, as we say in Hebrew, of those who are going to liberate Jerusalem. How excited we were, we didn't feel the earth under our feet. We felt that we were flying in clouds of excitement, on waves of excitement, I can't explain it. We disbanded to get into the tracks, then happened something which shook us from a direction we didn't think about to another kind of I would say excitement excitement. neighboring our camp there was an institution for uh, for uh, orphans some of them of the boys that were orphaned unfortunately their parents died but most of them were collected in Europe after the Holocaust they are found in monasteries, in uh, evil places, without parents, without family members. All the family, uh, family members were taken into the crematoriums to Auschwitz. What will we do them, with them? They collect them as could, they could from them and bring them into this institution. We were so, so much uh, concentrated in our excitement that we did not notice them but the children with their instructors heard everything and they suddenly shouted at us we wish you success go in peace and come back in peace when I just remember that I shake and it discovered to me something that I didn't think before. All this time I thought how I am co- going to be one of those who will fulfill 
the lasting, the prayers of 2,000 years, the, to continue to complete what the Maccabees did, what they rebelled against the uh, Romans. And now all this past is waiting for us. And now the children let us know that not only the past is waiting for us, all the future of our nation also is waiting for us and it's not less important. Those children, four or five years old, taught me a lesson which I didn't learn in my lifetime, not from adults nor from books. But not only the past is waiting for us, also they survived the hell of the Holocaust to wish us success for their sake. If until this minute, until this moment, I was so excited, from this moment, my excitement multiplied few more times until I felt I'm going to lose my mind from excitement. I felt I'm going to become crazy. I'm going to also for the future of peace. I said, God, let me survive just to take part in this great fight of Israel and then I don't care what will happen to me. We got close to the front. At 11, we were waiting that the sappers will blow the wall to storm into the old city. Then we were told that the Haganah asked to delay, a delay of an hour because they are not ready. The explosive they brought, which was formed by Haganah scientists, they said this is special to blow the wall and they gave us one of those bombs and they said this is the best thing to I mean the, uh, it, it, to, to blow the wall they brought these poor, poor boys brought this bomb which was very heavy six boys had to carry it when the Arabs from the wall from behind the wall they throw grenades and they shoot at the end when they activated this bomb the bomb blew and did not do anything to the wall just left a little uh, signs of ash or we didn't know that this is the reason we were mad at them we want to get in and they delayed and uh, we know that the government decided for a ceasefire at 5.30 in the morning and we need the time and, they, and now we have to wait this hour wasn't enough we had to wait more few hours and you know our nerves were so stretch, we, we want to get in, and they delayed. Delay, delay. At the end, after a few hours, we were told that the sappers are now on their way to the wall to be ready to attack. At that time, we sat when behind us was a, there's a monastery there close to the wall, and we could see what happens in Jerusalem, which is in our hands at that time. It was a dark night, but we could see how the enemy bombarded Jerusalem. We could see the, uh, the, flash, the fire flashes of the blows, and we could hear the bombs. And we saw and heard that the bombs are blowing closer and closer to where we sat. I told my friends, listen, every minute we can be hurt by bombs. Let us pull down the helmets so we could defend as much as we can the head from the, uh, uh, from the bombshells. We all pulled down the helmets and right after that I felt a tremendous, a tremendous push in my head and a stream of blood poured, was, got out from my head from above my right eye. Then I found that this bomb, as if it told me, if I want to reach your head, I'll find my way. A shrapnel, a big shrapnel, penetrated from under the helmet, above the eye, deep into my head. And my head bleeded badly. I stood up to get for and the, uh, also the pain was bad. And I stood up to get, to ask for help. I felt all my body uh, hurting. I understood that almost all my body got uh, pieces of, uh, of the bomb, but the worst was my head. And at that moment, something started bothering me, upset me. I heard someone saying, moaning, uh, groaning, saying, Oi! I thought, just a minute, 
I want to live and to survive I need badly a very urgent help my head is bleeding but there may be others other wounded others wounded how about them why shall I live on their account they have the right to live as well a second of upset and then I decided I will not live on the account of a friend of mine if there are others wounded let, let them get help before and I came, came back to my place it was a very very difficult decision but I couldn't find any alternative then the nurse stood up and she asked who's wounded here I waited a little to see if others will answer so that others didn't answer I stood up and I said I'm wounded she helped me to cross the street the other side of the street there was a place which was uh, uh, done for uh, first aid all this time she helped me to cross the street I knew my right eye has been blinded the left eye wasn't hurt but because of the tremendous pain in my head I couldn't open even the also the good eye so without looking I could hear what's happening that the bombs are blowing around and in my heart I prayed for the sake of this girl she wants to save my life and she risks her life from the with the bombs around we are around we are, we are arrived to this place and she met me sit on a chair and I heard someone a good friend of mine asking Mise who's that I wasn't surprised that he did not recognize me because my whole face was full of blood I thought if I'll tell him that it's me and I come it will hurt him we were good friends so with my broken head I started thinking what shall I tell him to calm him down so he won't be sorry so I decided I will tell him don't be sorry after all it's for all the sake of Yerushalayim but when I came to say that I remember that Jerusalem we didn't break into Jerusalem yet so I asked I tell him leave that now and tell me why don't we break into the old city what are we waiting for anymore before I've heard his answer We've heard a tremendous blow which shook the whole area. And right after that I've heard someone saying, the wall was blown. When I've heard these words, the wall of, was blown. It wasn't just a wall who separated between all and New Jerusalem. It was a wall who stood on our way to our Yerushalayim for 2,000 years. It was a wall who separated between us, the Jewish nation, and the place of the Kingdom of David. It separated between us and the mountain of God dear, 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 our people are getting back I felt I was caressing the skies from excitement only I told my friends I'm sorry I can't go along with you anymore go ahead let's God will be, will, be, will be with you they bandaged me bandaged me they had to carry me on a stretcher long way to the ambulance and all this way I feared for the sake of my friends they risk their lives to save my life they can themselves get killed from the bombs blowing around and on the way I felt another hit in my head this time a, b a bomb blew from my left side as we say Michael, on our right side the angel Michael and the left side the angel Gabriel and the, my head another shrapnel made a hole and got stuck there in my skull where I point they took me to the hospital I had to be operated when they brought me to the surgery room Dr. Beller whispered told me something very interesting be ready we are not making you sleep during the operation the operation took a whole day from the morning to the evening and not only that I was in full conscience all the time until now I remember every detail of this operation I won't tell you all the details it's interesting but of also I'm limited to time but one thing I will tell you I suddenly felt such such a thing that I thought it's impossible to continue on maybe it's the end of my life and suddenly my whole body shook maybe I was 
in the border between life and death and I felt I am facing the Kadosh Baruch Hu, I am facing God and he is asking me, I felt he is asking me what do you want to ask for? what do you pray for? I thought, my God, I am so sorry I didn't make a list so many things I would have loved, wanted but he is waiting, I won't let him wait what the most important thing I, I can ask for? I wanted to live, that's true. But then I remembered my, some of my best friends were killed. I thought, I'm not better. I don't have the right to ask for life. I'm not. So what shall I ask for? I said, God, my life is in your hands. You will decide if I will survive or not. But if you want me to ask you what I want, there's one thing I want badly. I want to hear that Jerusalem has been liberated. I survived this operation miraculously. I couldn't believe that a human can contain such quantities of blood as much as blood was pouring from my head. But I couldn't believe how tremendous was the miracle until I read the uh, the uh, medical report and I decided I have to copy it and I make copies of it in my book in Hebrew it, there is also a copy of it and it says not only that my head was uh, I mean that I was bleeding so much blood that a stream of liquid from my brain and my spine was pouring continuously continuously it wasn't just one minute or one hour it took more than 25 hours until I was operated and they brought me to the operation and I was operated continuously stream of liquid from my brain and my spine and here I'm alive I survived as I said miraculously but with a tremendous pain not physical pain. This wasn't, didn't bother us from the news. I've heard a nurse getting into my room, telling a nurse who was arranging my bed, Masha Weingarten, the daughter of the rabbi Van Weingarten, the rabbi of the old city, telling her, did you hear the news? Our boys were about to liberate the old city and the last minute they came the order by the government to stop fire at the old city state in the Arabs hands how do you want me to feel how do you want me to feel when I've heard details that the Etzel managed to blow the old the, the, uh, the new gate and they after they had four of their boys killed they started penetrating into the old city and they were ordered to get out the Arabs fled from the old city they evacuated the old city they ran away and the govern our government did not let us get, get into it. Then we learned that we could break a stone wall. We could break a wall of fire and ammunition. But when politic, politicians pose a, sto a wall of stone hearts, you are defeated. Our Yushalayim stands in the hands of our enemies. With the time I survived, Miraculously, with the months, years, I managed to have a family, children, but I stayed with one eye watching the old city, the old city wall, and behind the wall, our city stayed in the hands of our enemies, and it hurts. Why did we pray? It was in our reach, and we did not, did not reach. What for did we pray for 2,000 years? What for my, some of my best friends were killed what for I broke my head if not for this Jerusalem but maybe because of this prayer which I told you before I survived miraculously and after 19 years came the six days war and we got the word that Jerusalem has been liberated Temple Mount in our hands Yuda, Judea, Samaria the Sinai, the Golan in six days what a tremendous victory maybe for that and I saw 
instead of seeing foreign rulers, foreign soldiers, British, imposing a foreign rule in our country to see our own boys with a uniform of Jewish army. It's a tremendous change that it's been a dream. I had my four children join the army and fighting for our people. Tremendous thing. And I see oh, I, so many times our people celebrate the Independence Day, the day of Ju the Jerusalem Day, which are going to celebrate again next week. Maybe for that he left me alive to see all that. And maybe there's another reason to tell you this story. Maybe for that I survived. Because I know that people have to know what we did for the sake of this land. It's not just my story. It's a story which I, I, I speak for my friends who were killed. They can talk. It's also their story. That's why today is the third time I'm talking. In the morning I was in a school in Kiryat Arba. At noon I spoke to soldiers from the Air Force. And I ran here to tell you the story. And tomorrow again I have to be in different places. And I run from place to place to say the story. Because as I said... Every Jew has to know what we did for this land, what we did for our people, what we did for you, for the future of our people, for each of you, to be a free Jew in this country of yours, to live free and to be proud for this freedom, this torch of freedom, which we set which we raised is very very dear we prayed for it for so long for so many generations we fought for it my generation fought badly for it and bleeded badly for it paid a high price for it we handle it now to you to your hands hold it raise it with pride, with love. And this is, will be our, our reward. And what I want to say, my story is much longer. Of course, I can't say the whole story in such a short time. And there are many things which I wanted to tell you that I couldn't in that time. But there is, I found the solution. I wrote this book. All my memories are in this book, which came out, fortunately for you, as well as in English. So he wants it. I sell it for 50 shekel usually. But I know you students, maybe it's difficult for you. I make it special price for 40 shekel. He wants it. will get this book signed by me with a special blessing and photograph. And he who doesn't have money now and wants the book can have it and pay later through you. I don't know. Any, any way or I'll leave you my address, you can send me anyway I want you to read it because as I said it's not just my story today you're here, in future you're going to have families, children I hope I will tell them as well but this I can't promise what can make them know is the book so in my absence this book tell the story. That's also a very important reason why I come here. I don't ask for anything. Not here. All over the country I run with my car and you know today it's quite, quite expensive. The gas prices. But I, I don't get from the army even any shekel because this is what I give for the sake of my friends who, that you should know what we did. But as I said, I can't just uh, distribute this book free, free because it cost me to print it. And, that's, uh, and now, thank you for your, for your patience. And uh, I wish you to live in this country of yours, free from foreigners and with uh, the hope and the prayer 
that today we're here in the near future with God's help we could from here climb up to this pilgrimage to the temple and I hope that the Kohanim among you I hope Judah which is a Kohen will see him working the work of the Kohanim in Beta Mikdash which will be built I hope not long from now. Thank you.